to Journey of Enlightenment. I am your host, Dr. Roger Gopal. In our last episode, we looked at a conversation between Lachman and the Nashada chief. The context of this conversation was a grievance experienced by the Nashada chief upon looking at Sri Rama and Sita lying on the floor. The Nashada chief was so disturbed that the prince of Ayodhya, the lord of the solar rays, and his beautiful wife would find themselves lying on a dirt floor in the forest. Lachman, recognizing this disturbance in the mind of the Nashada chief, addressed the issue with pearls of wisdom. Lachman said to the chief, if you remember our last day's conversation, when Lachman told him, he said, a beggar in a dream became a king. A king in a dream became a beggar. Upon waking, what changed? The beggar was still the beggar and the king was still the king. It was just a dream. The real nature of the individual did not change. For the past week, I have been asked many a times to elaborate on the nature of the self. What exactly is the self? Who is the self? So I decided that today's episode, I will begin a discussion on the concept of the self. Why is this discussion of utmost importance? Because whatever we believe ourselves to be, that is how we respond and we interact with the world. We project to the world whatever we believe in ourselves. However, we see ourselves, how we perceive ourselves, that is the way that we interpret and respond to the world around us. If we see ourselves as being a victim of life, we see ourselves as depressed, we see ourselves as being incompetent, then that is the way that we respond to life. It is therefore important for us to have a proper and accurate view of the self. What I am sharing with you is not positive thinking, but it is a thinking that is based upon a healthy concept of the self. What exactly is this self that we talk about? Well, if you ask 1,000 people to describe the self, you may very well get 1,000 different answers, which is fine. So, I have asked this question, and many people give me answers such as, well, the self is me. So, of course, the question will then be, well, who are you? Who is this me? or this I that I keep referring to. So others would say, well, I am my personality. I am the accumulation of all my thoughts, all my emotions, all my physical senses, and that makes me, me. And that is indeed very correct when we look at it from a psychological perspective. But there are many other ways that we can look at the self. So I propose to look at this concept of the self from two aspects. I would look at it from the aspect of the teachings of the Vedas and the Upanishads, which we call Vedanta. And I will look at the concept of the self 
from another perspective called humanistic psychology. In today's episode, I will focus on the first aspect, which is the aspect of Advaita Vedanta. So, let us not become too confused over these terminologies. I will explain as we go along. Advaita means non-duality. In other words, oneness. No separation exists. So we'll call it non-duality in English. And Vedanta is simply two words into one. Veda, which means knowledge, and Anta, which means the end of. So Vedanta means the end of knowledge. Or some argue that it could simply mean the totality of this knowledge, the accumulation of what we need to know. The Upanishads is usually referred to as that, the end part of the knowledge, that discourse that was given to the Vedas. Advaita Vedanta then means that uh, it is the concept of the non-duality that exists or the oneness of everything, no separation. So the birds that we look at, the beasts that uh, run in the field, the fish that swim in the ocean, every human being that exists, the mountains that we look at, and the clouds that float above us are all one, according to Advaita Vedanta, non-dualism. So today we would look at the concept of the self from this perspective. I was at a university speaking just recently, and a student asked me that question. What is the nature of the self? So I, I looked at him and I said, the nature of the self is highly dependent of, upon our understanding of the nature of existence. Do we understand what is the nature of existence? And if we understand the nature of existence, then we can have a better insight into the nature of the self. So he said, well, so what is the nature of existence? So I told him, I said, look around us. What exists around us? Our nature is based upon time and that is how we measure everything it is based upon matter because we feel we see we touch and it is based upon space that gives us our concept of where so space time and matter are the elements that comprise our very existence. Now if we look at the same concept from the perspective of physics, we will know that space, time and matter had a beginning. Most uh, scientists in the field of uh, astrophysics will tell you that uh, most likely space, time and matter had a beginning at the Big Bang. When that one little particle existed, space, time and matter as we know it today did not exist until the Big Bang occurred. So there was a point in time or a period I should say when time itself did not exist when matter did not exist 
and when space did not exist. So, if we look at existence, we can simply say that existence as we know it is based upon time, space and matter, but there was a period when existence as we know it did not exist. Now, I know some of us might be thinking, what does have to do with uh, the concept of the self? Now, if we look at the self, this question, who am I? Who am I? It's basically asking the question, what am I? What is my purpose? And what is the very nature of my existence? Now we understand existence to mean space, time and matter. But we also now understand there was a point in time when existence did not exist. Therefore what existed? Advaita Vedanta attempted to answer this question. And uh, our great scholar and philosopher Adi Shankaracharya addressed it in the most superb manner possible. And it is his ideas that I'm sharing today on the nature of the self. When we look at the Upanishads, it addresses the nature of the self as that I am that I am. What is that which it is referring to? And what is the arm it is referring to? So let us go a bit further into this concept. I told the student at the university, if you want to first understand who you are, let us begin by eliminating who and what you are not. Now, he was a bit confused, so I told him, I said, it's, it's a very, very simple concept. Let us remove all this illusion. Or in other words, let us remove all these layers that hide your true nature, that disguise your true nature. And once that is removed, then what remains is who you are. So let us start with the first layer of who I am not. The first layer will be, let's call it, the physical body. The physical body, it's made up of our five organs, the eyes, the nose, the tongue, the skin, and the ears. That I am not. Now one could say, how could I not be those uh, sense organs? Well, the sense organs are simply our instruments that we use. So for instance, a person who cannot hear, does it change their core nature? Does it change the substratum of their being? And the answer is no. A person who cannot see will also say the same to you. Their true self, their true nature exists with or without the ability to see. Now how they function in this world will be different, but it doesn't change what the true nature is. In fact, can you imagine a world where no one had eyes? We might say, well, that would be a very strange world. But believe it or not, if we were all born without the ability to see, 
and nothing would be strange, would it? We would have learned how to function in this world without sight. And it would be very normal. I've heard that dogs are unable to see colors, so they see in black and white. But it makes no difference to them because that is what they are accustomed to. So therefore, these sense organs cannot determine who I am. They are just, as I said, instruments that we use to function. I am deeper than that. Well, if we look at the physical body, what about our cognitive organs? Seeing, smelling, tasting, touching, hearing. Isn't that who I am? No. We are still much deeper than these uh, cognitive sense organs. Well, then I must be the mind. So if I am not the body, I am le at least the mind because I see it goes into my brain, I process, I interpret, and then I respond. So therefore, my real self must be my mind. Well, the question is, from the perspective of non-dualism, Advaita Vedanta, what is the mind? The mind is subtler than the body, meaning that the body you can touch, you can feel, you can see, but the mind you cannot see. You can touch the brain, you might see the brain, but you cannot see the mind. The mind is simply the abode of thoughts, meaning the mind holds all our thoughts together like a container or a bucket with many thoughts in it. In fact, it is usually argued that the mind contains at least 50 to 60 thousand thoughts per day. Of that amount of thoughts, not all we are aware of. So thoughts would go through our minds all the time, but it's not yet reaching the intellectual part or the discriminatory part or that differentiating part of our brain. So we are therefore not the mind. If the mind goes blank, as in deep sleep, then nothing exists as far as we are concerned. But we are still existing. So therefore we cannot be the mind. Well, how about that part of the mind that is the intellect, that has the ability to distinguish one from the other? that reasoning capacity? Well, the answer is no. We are not the intellect. Why not? How then do we define thought? So the intellect goes into thought. It processes whatever object it sees it adds awareness to that object and that makes it thought. In other words, what is thought in this intellect? It is an object, so let's say an apple, a red apple, so there's an object. We see this object, but only because of an awareness we understand this object to be an apple or a banana, or a pineapple. That is the intellect. If we remove this object, then would thoughts cease to exist? Well, to an extent, yes. But would awareness cease to exist? And the answer is no. So therefore, I am not just thought. So let us repeat. 
who am I? I am not the body. Because the body is in the realm of time, space, and matter. I am not the mind. Because the mind is also in the realm of space, time, and matter. I am not the intellect. Because the intellect is still existing to a large extent in the realm of space, time and matter. In fact, if you look at the way we think, our minds are usually in the past, in the future, and hopefully sometimes in the present. So we are still trapped in this concept of time, space, and matter. I would hope that we understand our existence to be much more than time, space, and matter. So if we are not the body, if we are then not the mind and we are not the intellect, who am I? According to Advaita Vedanta, we are that awareness that exists and will continue to exist. That awareness is what we call consciousness. What is consciousness? Consciousness is an absolute awareness. It is the totality of our being. Without consciousness, then there is nothing. The question one asked me, where is consciousness? And I said, if you ask where, then you are subjecting consciousness to space. So therefore, consciousness is not bounded by space. If you ask when, then you are subjecting consciousness to time. Consciousness is not subjected to time. If you ask, can I see or feel consciousness, then we are saying that consciousness is subjected to matter and it is not subjected to matter. Consciousness, as the philosophers would say, is that which is when nothing else exists. That is consciousness. It is a very substratum of our very being. When we eliminate what we are not, we remain with awareness alone, which is our consciousness. Let's go back to this concept of thought. Thought is object plus consciousness or awareness if we then remove object, then thought cannot exist. But what do exist is consciousness alone. So beyond thought is the existence of consciousness. What is the nature of consciousness? It is Sat, Sit, Ananda existence, awareness, and bliss. That is our true nature. Our true nature is bliss, is love, is joy, is happiness. We are not bounded by the elements of time, space, and matter. We are not trapped in this world of just joy and sorrow, pain or pleasure, we transcend that very existence. We are consciousness in its pure form. Our issue is not just who am I, but in ignorance we live a life where we do not accept 
who we really are. We believe ourselves to be something that we are not and then we conduct our affairs as that, that which we are not. We are not the body. We are not the mind. We are not the intellect. Therefore, we should not be allowing ourselves to be subjected to those gratifications of what the body desires, what the mind longs for, what the intellect yearns for. But on the other hand, we subject our bodies, our mind and our intellect to the greater truth that is our existence, which is reality, awareness and bliss. That is our true nature. If we understand our true nature, then we would live as such. We would live a life of kindness, a life of tolerance, a life of patience, a life of empathy. And therefore, nothing in this world, whether we sleep on the floor or we sleep in a palace, whether we eat uh, street food or we sit in a five-star restaurant, makes no difference because we would enjoy all the same because we understand that our true nature transcends this very existence that we know as time, space and matter. Let us therefore not be trapped in this world of illusion. Let us, let us not be trapped in this world of materialism, but let us live at a higher order, a deeper understanding of our very nature. Our very nature is divine. Thank you very much for joining me on this session of Journey of Enlightenment.